Well, thank you very much, Steve, and, uh, and Brad, it's good to follow you. I thought that uh, there were some points that you made that were eminently sensible because they were consistent with the policy statements the government said so far. So um, I know you're not uh, operating at our behest, but uh, I found your presentation very interesting. Uh, I suspect today, uh, in terms of economic and political overview, there's possibly more interest in the political overview side of things. Uh, that might be more forthcoming in the Q&A session at the end of the speech rather than any sort of great detail that I intend to go into on the politics front uh, in terms of today's presentation. But I did today want to address uh, an economic overview of sorts, and I think it's important that we look over the immediate economic and political horizon and today's event really enables us the chance to do that. Now, after serving as Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer for the first 14 months of the Abbott Government, I was, just prior to Christmas, asked by the Prime Minister to undertake a new role. So I now work, as Stephen mentioned, as Parliamentary Secretary to both the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, as well as to the Minister for Trade and Investment, Andrew Robb. Now, principally, my role is to support the Coalition's agenda for economic engagement and growth spreading the message that Australia is open for business, securing new trade agreements for enhanced market access, and driving foreign investment to boost Australia's economic growth. Now, in the Treasury portfolio, I had, among other things, oversight of the Foreign Investment Review Board. So in this respect, I guess it'd be fair to say I've gone from, uh, from gamekeeper to poacher. And I highlight, however, that of the 800-odd applications that were presented to me in my former role, after applying appropriate consideration and scrutiny, I did not object to any of them. And I was pleased to approve around $150 billion of proposed investment into Australia over that 14-month period. And even though my new responsibilities have an international focus, ultimately, my work in both portfolios is focused on strengthening the Australian economy and increasing the prosperity of our people. Now, we live in a globalised, regionally integrated economy, so the nexus between international policy and domestic policy is more closely intertwined than it ever has been before. There's no doubt, however, that Australia faces significant economic challenges. In many respects, though, these challenges are shared across the developed economies of the world. Now, the reduction by more than $30 billion in forecast tax receipts a result of a collapsed iron ore price and weaker than forecast wages growth, presents as among the most significant of our challenges because of the consequent impact on Australia's fiscal position. The nominal GDP growth in 2014-15 is now anticipated by market economists to be weaker than last year's budget forecast. Commodity price declines continue to knock Australia's fiscal position around. Our terms of trade are now 25% lower than the peak level reached in September 2011. The price of iron ore, a significant Australian export obviously, hit 187 US dollars per tonne in 2011. Today, this morning, it's now $62 per tonne. However, challenges can also be viewed as opportunities. And we're seeing opportunity in the green shoots that are occurring across the economy. Take, for example, retail trade. Retail numbers have been going up for seven consecutive months and are 4.1% higher over the past 12 months. The ANZ Bank's Job Advertisements Index is at its highest level in more than two years, growing at 13.6% through the year. This represents the fastest growth in three and a half years. The RBA's recent interest rate cut has put the cash rate at a new record low of 2.25%. It's the first rate cut in 18 months and means a typical Australian family with a $300,000 mortgage has an extra $750 a year in their pocket. Lower petrol prices have also helped to take some of the stress off household budgets. A family using 50 litres of petrol a week now has around an extra $17 every week compared to May last year. And in 2014, more than 223,000 new companies were registered in Australia, up more than 10% over the year 2013. So these are all strong and encouraging signs. Globally, growth is expected to pick up gradually in 2015 and 2016, with the Treasury forecast uh, of global growth of 3.75% in 2015 
and 4% in 2016. And this is roughly in line with IMF forecasts. And Australia's major trading partners are expected to grow above trend. So that, frankly, is good news for exporters here in Australia. Growth in China is moderated, but remains very strong. Treasury expects the Chinese economy to grow by six and three quarter percent in 2015. And it's clear that the United States has turned the corner. We expect the US economy to grow by about 3% both this year and next. And with their strengthened recovery, the US is focusing on normalising monetary policy, which on balance is a positive for Australia. Not only is it a definite sign of a stronger US economy, but the boost to global demand is good for everyone. And importantly, opens up the prospect of greater US investment in Australia. So mixed economic messages continue However, the bulk of economic indicators point to slow but ongoing global growth. Now for the coalition, this crystallises that our task is to help businesses to capitalise on these green shoots so we can be inoculated against future downturns. As the Prime Minister declared on the, last, on the night of the last election, Australia is open for business. Foreign investment is a critical driver of the Australian economy. Investment drives global value chains. So for Australia, two-way investment with our own region is vital to boosting our national income. Whether it be a Singaporean sovereign wealth fund that's investing in new infrastructure, or an SME in South Melbourne investing in larger premises, to attract investment, Australia must continue microeconomic reform. Now the Abbott government has already cut $2.1 billion worth of red tape that constrains business. In this regard, we remain committed to a billion dollars a year at least of red tape reduction. But we must continue this reform process to ensure investors continue to find Australia attractive as a place to invest their capital. A significant effort for the coalition, in particular for the Treasurer, was getting G20 member countries to embrace our bold idea of additional microeconomic reform in pursuit of a global growth agenda. G20 member states account for 85% of global GDP, more than three quarters of global trade, and two thirds of the world's population. So Australia's dogged pursuit of additional reforms to boost global growth will have a marked impact on tens of millions of people across the planet. The G20 is large enough to have real global impact, yet dynamic enough to be effective. Now, last year under our presidency, the G20 shifted its focus to driving sustained global growth. G20 nations committed to Australia's target of lifting global economic growth by more than 2% above business as usual over the next five years to 2018. It was termed the Brisbane Action Plan, and it contains over 800 separate reform measures. Now, analysis by the IMF and OECD indicate that these growth strategies will lift collective G20 GDP by 2.1% over and above what otherwise would have been. Now, 2.1% of additional global growth means adding more than $2 trillion to the global economy, creating millions of new jobs over the next five years. Now, we've published these growth strategies so that everyone can see what we've collectively committed to doing and to hold us all to account. This bold reform represents a real difference that Australian leadership has made to global growth. But it was by no means the only outcome of Australia hosting the G20 last year. We also focused on infrastructure, and Brett made many comments in relation to infrastructure just before me. G20 leaders agreed to launch a global infrastructure initiative to address the $70 trillion gap in infrastructure needed over the next 15 years. I worked on this project personally in my previous role and was delighted we were able to seek agreement for this initiative, which will see a new international organisation, the Global Infrastructure Hub, located in Sydney. The Hub's four-year mandate from G20 leaders tightly focused on, one, addressing key data gaps that matter to investors, two, creating model documentation covering project identification, preparation and procurement, Three, building the capacity of government officials by sharing best practice approaches. And four, 
by developing a consolidated database of infrastructure projects to help match potential investors with projects. So I hope in some respects, Brett, that addresses some of the concerns that you raised. Importantly, Australia is committed to enable all nations, not just those of the G20, to work with the hub and draw upon its expertise. Establishing the hub is a significant and practical initiative that Australia achieved to drive faster progress on the G20 infrastructure agenda and to move engagement with the private sector beyond business as usual. Ultimately, we believe the global economy, G20 countries and beyond, will be better off because the G20 met in Brisbane and because of Australia's stewardship last year. Australia now works closely with Turkey as this year's G20 president and we look forward to our continuingly strong relationship with China, who hosts the G20 in 2016. Now, beyond the G20, a great contributor to our economic, uh, economic future will be the extraordinary impact the recently negotiated free trade agreements, which Stephen spoke about, uh, will have on Australia's economy in the years ahead. The fact that Japan and Korea agreements are now up and running, and that negotiations with China have been finalised, is, ex is an extraordinary achievement that was uh, reached in the relatively early days in the life of this government. These three North Asian giants account for 55% of all of Australia's exports. So there is enormous potential in breaking down the barriers to entering and expanding in these markets. The Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement commenced earlier this year. It's the most liberalising agreement on agriculture that, is, that Japan has ever agreed to. And this agreement opens up new opportunities and guarantees market access across the board in manufacturing, resources, energy, services, investment to the world's third largest economy for Australian exporters. Modelling of the Korean FTA indicates good liberali goods liberalisation in that agreement will be worth nearly $5 billion in additional income to Australia over the next 15 years. It predicts manufacturing exports to Korea will be 53% higher than would have otherwise have been the case without the agreement. Now, in addition, increased exports are expected to help create 1,700 jobs in the first year of operation alone. And then there's China. Last financial year, more than $90 billion worth of Australian resources, energy and manufactured goods were exported to China. Now, once this agreement is implemented, 99.9% .9 of those exports will enter China duty-free. Dairy and other agricultural products also have a great deal of service, uh, also offer a great deal, and services companies will enjoy unprecedented access to growth at the frontier of China's economic transformation. And the agreement will help boost investment flows between Australia and our biggest trading partner. And I know that Minister Robb is committed to making sure that he doesn't slow any of this down in this regard. We're also advancing two multilateral agreements the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Both will have a large economic dividend for Australia. These agreements improve supply chains and increase economic integration in the regions. And both agreements present significant opportunities for, business specialising, uh, for businesses, especially in terms of streamlining trade agreements between large groupings of significant trade partners. The TPP in particular will give Australia new market access and economic opportunities in countries like Canada, Mexico, Peru, countries with which we currently do not have an FTA. And of course, we're pursuing our agreement with India. These represent an ambitious agenda, but an agenda that I think the coalition has demonstrated we are well and truly up to. We take an ambitious but practical approach. We achieve consensus through other nations joining us in taking action, and we've achieved that through the G20 and we continue to achieve that on trade. Now, we all know that Australia's future lies not just within our own borders, but with the way we interact with the world, both strategically and economically. Now, at the G20, we focused on jobs and growth, and we intend to do the same thing domestically. And we want to continue these reforms in a domestic context. Now, I attended the Asia-Europe Finance Minister's meeting in Italy last year. And while the meeting was discussing the need for fiscal consolidation, we were reminded by one of the finance ministers at the table of a quote by the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Jean-Claude Juncker, who said, we all know what we need to do. We just don't know how to get re-elected after we've done it. <laughs> now, encouraging, encouragingly, I note Mr. Juncker is the longest standing democratically elected head of government in the world, 
So that's something that all of us as politicians can take stock in. So for those of you who are looking at the polls, listening to the pundits, I say the coalition will weather the storm that comes with reform. We will weather the storm because we must weather the reform, and we must weather the storm. It's simply not an option for Australia to continue to kick the debt can down the road. To do so represents the most indulgent and inequitable act a government can undertake. It truly represents intergenerational theft, robbing future generations in order to pay for maintaining unsustainable policies today. For my part, I look forward to continuing this task and working with CEDA on what is an important national issue. And for the Coalition, our commitment to sustainable fiscal reform remains absolutely central to our view of the national interest. I appreciate the chance to speak with you all today. Thank you.